I've talked in previous videos about holidaying as a kid in Pitlochry, one of my favourite places. Not only is the area and town incredible, but its central location is perfect to use as a base for exploring other areas and places in and around Scotland. A couple of places we visited in the summer of 1985 were Balmoral and Glam's Castle. I don't remember much about Balmoral, but I have fond memories of our trip to Glam's. Why? because of the incredible ghost stories. Glam's is located in the ancient county of Angus, on the east coast of the country. The land that Glam's sits on has had fortification or notable structure there since the 11th century, but the area has been inhabited for far longer. The first castle to be built on the site is from the 14th century and was built after the Lyon family were granted lands by King Robert II. The Lyons are an ancient family of Anglo-Norman descent who arrived in England in 1080 after the Norman Conquest, emigrating to Scotland in the 14th century and settling down in Angus. One of the more notable descendants of the family was Elizabeth Bowes Lyon, mother of the late Queen Elizabeth II of England. After hundreds of years of ownership, it's not surprising that the castle has gone through numerous improvements and design changes in its time, with the current structure being finalised in the 18th century. However, it's the ghosts we're here to talk about, not the structure. But the structure does have a part to play in it. Glam's has had a reputation as being haunted for hundreds of years. It was certainly known as a notoriously haunted location as far back as the time of William Shakespeare. In fact, the real Macbeth, the inspiration behind the Scottish play, is believed to have murdered King Duncan on the land that Glam's now occupies, with the violence of this murderous act set to linger on. There's a stone floor in one of the castle's more ancient rooms, known as King Malcolm's room. There is a long-held tradition that this room is believed to be the site where the murder was thought to have taken place. As is tradition with many ancient murder stories, there was reported to be a bloodstain left that could not be removed, no matter how often or how vigorously it was washed. The floor was eventually boarded over, covering this gruesome piece of history for good. Malcolm's ghost is said to haunt Glam's. After his apparent assassination, his spirit is reported to roam the castle, opening and closing doors in the dead of the night. Famously, Glam's is said to have many hidden rooms. There are wonderful stories of Victorian dinner parties being held where guests, aware of the stories of secret or hidden rooms, would hang towels or items of clothing from their own room, then venture into the castle grounds to count the windows without towels. I remember when we visited, our tour guide relaying these tales and claiming that on one occasion, 12 windows were without towels. Is it possible there are that many secrets hidden within the castle walls? Quite possibly. There is a room, long hidden, that's said to harbour an awful secret. One that shocked the Earl of Glam's into silence. The origins of this story go back hundreds of years, to an age when the Lyon and Lindsay clan were engaged in a bitter, ongoing feud. The story goes that on a cold, snowy night, a group of Lindsays, who were on the run and fleeing from other clans, sought refuge in the grounds of Glam's. Pleading with the then Earl, they were granted shelter for the night and promised food and warmth. However, the Earl, filled with hatred for the Lindsays, had no intention of keeping them safe, and having tricked them, he led them to a room where he locked them in, never to let them out. Noises, loud moans and sudden bangs are often reported to be witnessed in the castle. Cries and groans echoed through its cold, stone passages evening after evening for hundreds of years after. These reached a peak 150 or so years ago and the then Earl decided it was time to put an end to them. One particularly dreadful night, he and some staff set off to follow the noises. He followed them to a room with an ancient wooden door in an area of the castle where few people ventured. Turning the key, he slowly pushed open the heavy door. What he saw made him drop back into the arms of his companions in a dead faint. The door was quickly locked again and would be later bricked up. Afterwards, no matter how tenacious the line of questioning, 
the Earl would never speak of what he saw. But the bricked up room is thought to be the room that the unfortunate clansmen were left to die in. In his 1912 book, Scottish Ghost Stories, author Elliot O'Donnell writes of a haunting that was witnessed by a Miss McGuinney in the late 19th century. Travelling in late autumn, she arrived at Glam's in what she described as the most frightful blizzard. Happy to eventually be inside the warmth of Glam's 16-foot thick castle walls, her bags were taken to her room in the oldest part of the castle, the Square Tower. Later that evening, during the evening's dinner party, the conversation between guests soon turned to ghosts, and in particular the hauntings associated with Glam's. Although she was enjoying the topic, she did take the stories with a healthy pinch of salt, and paid no heed to them. The evening drew to a close and Miss McGuinney retired to her room, her long day's travel having caught up with her, and she soon fell soundly asleep. As the evening had gone on, the blizzard abated, the winds had died down and all was still. Now the gloom of the night had passed, her room was bathed in moonlight and was deathly quiet. Soundly asleep, she was shortly to be awoken by a loud noise. Given she'd been in a heavy sleep before being woken, she took a few seconds to find her bearings. Aware that there had been a commotion, but unsure what it was or where it emanated from, she strained to see in the darkness to help her understand her situation. As she gradually came to, she couldn't shake the feeling that she wasn't alone in her room, and as she put it, I became afraid, an irrepressible tremor pervaded my frame, my teeth chattered and my blood froze. She sat upright in her bed, listening intently to the silence. Soon she could hear a noise in the distance, a noise she described as the footsteps of someone wearing chainmail, footsteps that were drawing ever closer. Now she could hear clanging and banging noises, and the footsteps quickened. She realised now that she was hearing a fight with an aggressor and a defender. Then she realised the noises were now happening directly outside the door to her room. It sounded to her like a battle to the death between two skilled warriors. She could hear weapons clash, the sounds of two men moving back and forth, vying for supremacy on the wooden floor as they evaded the blows and attacked each other and she could hear grunts and heavy breathing from the efforts of battle. She then heard what she claimed to be the sound of an axe cutting through a helmet, then the sound of a body slumping against her door, then being dragged away. On opening the door she saw nothing, no trail of blood, no fallen warrior, nothing. What did she hear that evening? Is it possible that she witnessed the echoes of a battle fought hundreds of years prior, being relived the night she stayed in Glam's? With close to a millennia of history, tens of thousands of people will have passed through its fortified doors over the centuries. Besides modern day tourists, hundreds, possibly thousands of servants will have worked there over the years and a female servant with a vicious appetite is believed to have been responsible for one of the more sanguinary tales. It's believed that hundreds of years ago she was caught in the act of attacking and drinking the blood of a male guest. Horrified guests chased her off, but she was eventually captured and bricked up in a room where she's said to still slumber to this day. Legend has it that her prison hasn't stopped her from trying to satisfy her bloodlust. There are stories that she's escaped on two occasions and attacked people in the castle before being recaptured. Could there really be a sleeping vampire bricked up in the walls of Glam's? One heartbreaking apparition that's been regularly spotted since she first appeared is known as the Tongueless Woman. Sir David Bowes Lyon learned about the haunting as a young boy when he was told of an encounter a guest had late one night. While out for an evening walk in the grounds of the castle, her guest reported seeing a face at one of the castle windows. The face was described as pale, tongueless and frightened, 
and gave the impression it was pleading for help. As he spoke to it, the apparition disappeared, but was replaced by a blood-curdling scream, then silence. After a minute or two, the silence was broken by footsteps making their way down some stone steps. The footsteps were clear enough that our guest believed he could discern whatever he was hearing walked with a limp. As if that wasn't enough, he became aware that he could now hear heavy breathing coming from the other side of the large wooden door in front of him. Then the door slowly swung open. Our guest, overwhelmed by what he was witnessing, could now see an old woman staggering through the doorway, carrying what appeared to be a bulky sack on her back. She quickly walked off into the trees out of her guest's sight. In an incredible coincidence, the same guest holidayed in Italy some years later and was given shelter by some monks after being caught in a blizzard. After learning of his time in Glam's, they shared a story of a British woman living in a local nunnery who'd somehow stumbled upon a secret so terrible that it could threaten a very wealthy British family. The monks relayed how she'd been silenced by the family by having her hands cut off and her tongue cut out. The monks took him to see her, and to his horror, it was the woman he'd seen escaping the castle years before. Had he seen the tongueless woman's crisis apparition, the ghost of a person still alive? In the years since, a woman has been seen running through the grounds, with blood dripping down her face, pointing to her tongueless mouth. Glam's, like most ancient seats of power, has its own chapel. Built between 1679 and 1683 and located on the northeast wing of the main building, this small oak panelled room has seen many a noble person find solace in its quiet, peaceful surroundings. It's also haunted, very haunted. Although no one knows for sure, many believe that the apparition frequently cited here is that of Janet Douglas, Lady Glam's. And once you know her story, you may well understand why she would return to haunt the chapel. Born in 1498, Janet was born a Douglas, a clan who'd fallen out of favour with the then ruler, King James V, after her brother Archibald, the king's stepfather, had imprisoned a young James for almost three years. After his escape in 1528, James's hatred only seemed to grow over the years, and this hatred extended to Janet with James finally catching up with her in July 1537. James concocted charges of witchcraft against her, despite there being no evidence. James had to find evidence of witchcraft or force a confession. So he had members of Janet's family imprisoned and tortured until he felt he had enough evidence to secure a conviction, which he did, and Janet was burned as a witch in Edinburgh Castle, while her son, still a boy, was forced to watch on. In the preceding years, the apparition of a small woman wearing a period grey dress has been regularly seen in the chapel at Glam's. Among the many people to witness the grey lady was the late Queen Mother, but perhaps her most famous appearance was witnessed by the dowager Countess Granville in the 19th century. While playing on the chapel organ, she became aware there was another presence within the chapel where she believed herself to be alone. Looking around, she was surprised to see a figure of a small woman, dressed in grey, kneeling in prayer on one of the chapel pews. Lady Granville felt this must have been somebody who'd entered to pray and gone unnoticed, as the woman appeared as solid as you or I, so much so that Lady Granville could see detail in her dress and was impressed by how neatly turned out the lady was. It was only when the sun broke through the cloud and shone on the figure that she noticed something wasn't as it should be the sun shone right through the figure, making a pattern on the floor. Feeling unafraid, Lady Granville decided to continue playing, and when she'd finished, the Lady in Grey had vanished. A similarly peaceful encounter happened some time later to Lady Granville's nephew, Timothy, the 16th Earl. After spending some time in the chapel admiring its artwork, he too noticed the figure of a small lady dressed in grey, kneeling in prayer. Not wishing to disturb her, he quietly left the chapel.
Our next tale could be one of three people. Charles VI of Strathmore, Alexander Lindsay, the fourth Earl of Crawford, or Alexander Lyon, the second Lord of Glams. All three were given the nickname of Earl Beardy, and all three were avid gamblers. Whichever nobleman you believe to be the notorious Earl. The story starts late one stormy Saturday evening. The Earl had drank and dined in the castle and was desperate for a game of dice or cards. Knowing his fiery temper, most inhabitants of the castle rejected the Earl's demand to play, angering him even further. Enraged by the lack of a partner, he stormed through the castle, cursing and shouting as he went, finally retreating to his chambers, where he set up a deck on the table and called on the devil himself to play. After the commotion caused by the Earl died down, there was a knock on the heavy wooden door. Are you still looking for a partner? A booming voice cried. Aye, enter whoever you are, replied the Earl. Slowly the door opened, and silhouetted in the doorway was a tall, slender man wearing a long black cloak. Entering the room, he nodded to the Earl and took his seat at the table. Without a word, the stranger picked up his hand, then stakes were discussed. As you expect, the stranger's stakes were high, but desperate to play, the Earl agreed, and agreed to sign whatever bond the stranger put his way, should he be unable to honour the debt. A mistake he would soon come to regret. As the ale continued to flow and inhibitions were shed, the stakes grew higher and higher. The Earl had found himself in an incredible streak of luck and grew increasingly confident. Nothing could deter him, or, as he believed, beat him, given the streak he was on. But all streaks come to an end, and eventually the Earl's luck ran out. Enraged to have lost, the Earl threw his cup across the room and cursed out the stranger and accused him of cheating. Given the ruckus coming from the room, the servants became concerned and listened intently by the Earl's door. One man more curious than the rest stole himself and looked through the keyhole to the room, but fell back, screaming in pain. Disturbed by the noise, the Earl threw the door open and bellowed at the servants, telling them in no uncertain terms to get back to their duties and take the injured servant with them. When the Earl turned round to go back into the room for one more game, he couldn't see the stranger. He'd vanished, as had the bond the stranger had encouraged him to sign. Confused, the Earl replayed the moments before opening the door in his mind and remembered seeing the stranger turning towards the door and uttering, Smite that eye. It's believed the servant then received a burst of flame through the keyhole. A few years later, death finally caught up with the Earl and almost immediately sounds of cursing, drinking and gambling were heard to come from the Earl's room. The stranger had won his final prize, the Earl's soul. It's believed the Earl was cursed to play the stranger, Old Nick, forevermore until he can win back his soul. Dozens of people have reported hearing these sounds and seeing strange figures in the Earl's room over the years. One famous encounter involves a noblewoman who brought her child to stay in the castle. While she was housed for the night in Earl Beardy's room, her child was put to bed in a small room off the main chamber. While she dozed, she was startled awake by a noise and saw a large male figure in chain mail cut through the room and enter the room her child slept in. Leaping from her bed, she ran to the room and threw the door open. Her child was sat up in bed in tears, claiming that a giant had been leaning over the bed. This was not the first time this had been reported, as several years before, around 1869, the Lord Halifax had reported something eerily similar. Lord Strathmore's sisters also reported feeling a beard brush against her, waking her from her sleep and then witnessing a giant leaning over her while she lay in bed. Awakening her husband, his shrieks of terror seemed to have scared the apparition off. Perhaps the saddest story associated with Glams is that of the beast or monster of Glams. For over 200 years, it's been whispered that in 1821, 
the firstborn child of the 11th Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn, Thomas Lyon Bowes was born with hideous deformities, afflictions so severe that he would never be able to take up his position as the 12th Earl. Thomas would forever be seen as a blight on the family and an embarrassment that had to be hushed up and never spoken of in polite society. As such, he had to be locked away in the farthest reaches of the castle and for all intents and purposes, forgotten about. Now, the official records show that Thomas was born and died on the same day, but as no gravestone was erected for the tragic infant, rumours soon spread that the child was still alive somewhere within the castle walls. As you often find with stories like this, interest in the rumours grew and made its way into high society. Guests who stayed, intrigued by what they'd heard, would try and locate the secret room where the monster was hidden. Sir Horace Rumbold, a prominent British diplomat, was one of these curious guests. In 1877, he joined a search looking for Thomas, who was now being cruelly described as resembling a human toad. Sir Horace recounts, Somebody hit upon the ingenious device of opening the windows all over the castle and hanging out each of them a sheet, or towel, or pocket handkerchief. Soon, innumerable white signals were fluttering in the breeze when Lord Strathmore unexpectedly returned. Strathmore's return put an end to any further investigation. There does seem to have been some truth to the story circulating. Covering up family shame is not new for nobility. Charlotte Grimstead and Catherine Bowes Lyne, cousins of the late Queen, were both born with severe mental disabilities. As with Thomas, they could not be seen in polite society, so from early childhood they spent their lives moving from one home or hospital to another. Then there are the witnesses. One workman who had been brought in to help repair some stonework accidentally knocked his way through a wall. Peering through the hole he'd created, he recoiled in horror, screamed and was found weeping, huddled in a corner of the room. The Earl was summoned and soon after, the workman who'd previously lived from job to job found he now had enough money to emigrate and live a comfortable life in Australia. In 1904, Lord Ernest Hamilton wrote in the New York Sun newspaper. On one occasion, a young doctor who was staying in the castle professionally found on returning to his bedroom that the carpet had been taken up and relayed. He noted that the pattern of the carpet was different at one end of the room. By moving the furniture and raising the carpet, he laid bare a trapdoor, which he forced open, and found himself in a passage. The passage ended in a cement wall. The cement was still soft, leaving the impress of a finger. He returned to his room and next morning received a cheque for his services with the intimation that the carriage was ready to take him to the station for the first train. Thomas's existence soon came to be known as the Secret of Glams, a secret that very few people knew, and on turning 21, the male heir to Glams would be told the heartbreaking and horrifying tale. Virginia Gabriel, a noted singer of the day, had stayed at Glams in 1870 for a period of time. She later recounted to her niece a conversation between the Lady of Glams and Andrew Ralston, the castle factor. Lady Strathmore once confessed to Mr Ralston her great anxiety to unravel the mystery. He looked earnestly at her and said very gravely, Lady Strathmore, it's fortunate that you don't know it and can never know it, for if you did, you would not be a happy woman. In the 19th century we had perhaps the most famous encounter with the monster, an experience relayed by a Lady Bond in later life. As a young woman, Lady Bond spent some time in Glams with her mother and sister, her bedchambers of course being in the old square tower as she hoped to find an aviary within its ancient walls. After retiring to bed in her large comfortable room, it didn't take long for her to drift off into a sound sleep. At some point she stirred and awoke to find herself in, as she described it, unfamiliar surroundings. 
The room she awoke in had a high ceiling, circular shape, and was dimly lit by the moonlight coming through a small window at the far side of the room. While her eyes grew accustomed to the dark, she could make out some of the furniture dotted around the room. Furniture, she felt, was more akin to that of a prison cell than that of a guest room in a stately home. Her attention soon shifted to a dark corner of the room. She was no more afraid than curious, more so after she heard movement coming from the corner her attention had been drawn to. The noises she heard she compared to the rocking of a soft body on the cold wooden floor and she could hear breathing, laboured breathing, as if something was struggling for its very existence. Soon she could distinguish a shape, horribly misshapen. She saw crooked legs, a tawny coloured, rounded body, long spidery arms and a large bestial head with dirty, matted grey hair and inhuman pointed ears. Her eyes, now fully accustomed to the dark, would soon be able to make out the facial features of this abomination. White, pig-like, and with eyes that stared at her with a malevolent glare that chilled her to the bone. Thankfully for Lady Bond, her door opened, and that seemed to break the enchantment, and her room was now as she remembered. There is a belief that the monster had an almost unnaturally long life, living to over a hundred. If this is true, if the tortured true heir of Glams did live to over a hundred, then Thomas lived on into the 1920s, possibly even the 1930s. There have been many reports that the apparition of the monster has been seen. In fact, one of our viewers recently commented on the Phantom of the Forest video that his grandmother worked in Glams during the war and that the ghost of the monster has been seen by staff, often. Do these accounts lend credence to the story of Thomas, the poor, unfortunate child, cruelly dubbed as the monster of Glams being a reality? Why are so many ghosts and strange events associated with one single location? Is it the castle that captures the tragedy or energy from a thousand years of history? Or does the power of these events leave a lasting impression on the land itself? Or could it be the lions themselves that are the cause of it? There is a legend that Sir John Lyon, the first Earl of Glams, had a cursed golden goblet known as the Lion Cup. Could this be the cause of most, if not all, of the strange and unusual events at Glams Castle? <laughs>